we're taking you know our corporation on that journey more toward um, an outcome based you know performance culture than an input based and I think that's that's been the biggest challenge is you know it, Chris if I talk about performance and how we've managed in the past from a a leadership perspective and this maybe can even go back to you know HR 101 that we were all taught you know when we first started out in these industries you know you started out talking about you know a lot of management by objectives and let's put in my you know goals for the year and all that um, and what that what that caused was this interesting dynamic from performance of you know how many things you did was how you were you know assessed at the end of the year. That's that's a you know a very traditional way of, of doing HR. But we've made it made a pretty um, aggressive pivot toward outcome based performance management. So it doesn't matter if you you know did fifty different things for the year. What did you actually do to produce value for the organization? How did you drive this initiative, that initiative? How did how did we make money? You know, based on based on what you did. One, welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast. Today, I'm joined by John Novak, who's the Managing Director and Global Head of HR Service Delivery and Talent Acquisition at Swiss Re. On the episode, we discuss why great leaders focus on outcomes, not input, as well as the challenges of attracting and retaining talent in a remote environment. As always, before we jump into the video, make sure you hit the subscribe button, turn on notification bell and follow on your favorite podcast platform. With that being said, let's jump in. Welcome to the show, John. How are you? Thank you, Chris. I am fabulous. How's everything with you? Good. I think the last time I saw you, we were live in front of 8,000 people, <laughs> albeit, 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 albeit virtually. <laughs> Yeah, I think we were. I think we were live, and and I think my technology was not working. So I think I was using my <laughs> iPhone, which was um, probably a fabulous connection. If I yeah, could yeah. Listen, we're we're so used to this now at this point, aren't we? Let's be honest. Over the last couple of years of just making it work, no matter what, whether it's your phone, your iPad, your, and there's so many platforms as well. It's like Teams, Zoom, you know, the platforms that we use as well. So we we made it happen. That's what matters. Um, how how things we, been since then? We made it happen, and it, listen, yeah, I've been well. You know, been well since then. I think the last time you and I spoke, um, I was probably just moving into into a new role. So yes. um, now a little bit further into that into that journey, but still feel like a newbie if I'm honest. You know, <laughs> around this. So, uh, but but it's all it's all good. You know, we got through the summer. I think we're you know we're all feeling a little bit um, you know better about the the environment. And what I mean about that is the COVID environment, but obviously things like the war in Ukraine, um, you know, the inflationary pressures, et cetera, you know, the, uh, what we move from one challenge to, know. you know, a set of others. And, and it's just, it just keeps on going. I think we all realize that there never will be, <laughs> there's always going to be something, you know, and, and, uh, I think a lot, many people have figured out that we are a lot more resilient than we thought, you know, um, uh, during that time, there'll always be something. So it's one of the reasons why I don't even look at the news anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's always something they're trying to scare you about, right? And, uh, and and something's going wrong. But yeah, it's it's yeah. I think I think it's fair, Chris. You know, the the whole resilience topic is something we talk about, you know, often. And uh, you know, yeah, co corporations have been been resilient. You know, you look at uh, you know corporate profits have actually been fairly stable this year, which is which is helpful. Um, you know, but at the same point. You know the you know the, the workforce and and the kind of move back to normalcy has taken a little bit longer than I think a lot of people expected. You know that's yeah. and that's that's taken some of us by surprise. So the you know the, the macro labor markets are still tough, as as you know. Um, you know getting people to you know move back you know into the roles that they had several years ago is a challenge. Um, you know reinventing you know corporations. You know, you you and I were talking about you know reinventing into a digital world. You know from a physical world. Yeah. I you know that's still that's still taking you know quite a bit of time yeah yeah and it, and it will continue to do so uh, i gave everyone a quick intro of your role before we started but can you just break out break down your role responsibilities for everyone just to give everyone a bit of an overview yeah thanks a lot chris so yeah so uh two roles i have here at swiss re uh one is i own what's called service delivery uh that's all the administration of the, the HR functions. So project management, um, the, the service centers, uh, the 
uh, kind of technology stack, et cetera. And then I'm the head of the COE for talent acquisition as well. So we we separate TA into two different worlds. We have operational talent. Um, so that's the recruiting teams that sit in the region. And then we have a center of expertise around TA that sits with me. Mm-hmm. Interesting that you got both those roles. Is that that's not not, not as typical? <laughs> <laughs> It's not typical at all. Um, you know, it kind of fell a little bit into, you know, into my lap in terms of the operating model. Uh, you know, the, there's a little bit of history around that. The the operational parts of the recruiting team um, did sit with me when I joined this role okay. and, and the European team reported into me. Um, but what we decided to do as part of just our, our transformation is we wanted to move some of the, the HR uh, work closer to the client. And what that meant was push it into the regions, push it into the countries, be closer to where the actual work is done, um, kind of lighten up the COEs, you know, a little bit. So a little bit less central guidance, less heavy, you know, from the center. And so I, um, I gave up a big portion of my portfolio, but with that, I gained, um, you know, a small lean team at the top that handles, um, you know, process design. What is our technology? What is our employer branding? You know, how do we, how do we make lives easier? you know, mm. for candidates, for our managers, for, for our recruiters. So, so we've separated out that thought leadership from the operational aspects. Well, on that point then, how has the last couple of years shaped your talent acquisition strategy? <laughs> oh, I'm sure you could ask that of every HR person. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, you know, a cu- couple things it's done. You know, one, it's to, to your, you know, comment around technology. You know, I don't think we've done an in-person interview in years. You know, I mean, even as we've, you know, even as we've moved back to a physical office and and we have, you know, we still use, uh, we use Teams, you know, or Zoom or whatever the platform is to, to connect, you know, with our candidates. Um, You know, one, it speeds time to market. You know, before where we were flying people around, you know, moving, you know, moving people from point to point, you know, our, our speed of execution, you know, is is much better. Um, I think, you know, and candidates from a digital standpoint um, expect a lean process, you know, so so as in the past, think about where, you know, you maybe started if you go back, you know, 10 years around your experience as a candidate, you know, you would expect to go in, have a very heavy process, let's fill out a 14 page form, um, you know, maybe I'll get, you know, call in three weeks, et cetera. You know, all of that has been adjusted, you know, and and now, you know, the the idea of, you know, you know, an iPhone and single click, and I'm going to get a call back in two days, and the process is going to be quite lean all the way through. Um, You know, it's, it's forced us to really rethink how we, you know, kind of how we run ourselves. And then I think the most important one, Chris, is how you brand you know, yourself as an organization, um, you know, the, you know, employees and how, and candidates, how they interact, you know, in their first int- instance with a company, you know, if they go onto your webpage and the first thing they see is, you know, something that doesn't resonate, you know, with them as, as an individual, and that's either from a employer purpose perspective, it could be de i it could be, you know, did you even say that you pay well, you know, as, as a company, you know, what do you, what are you telling them you stand for as yeah. an organization and how do they, how, what is their first feeling? Um, you lose them, you lose them right off the bat. So, you know, so we're, we're really focused on how does our, how do we brand ourselves? How do we get the process, you know, quicker? Um, you know, how do we make employees feel? And then, Chris, I think I'll end with, you know, the the stickiness in a hard labor market is different than it's been any time in the past. You know, we, you know, traditionally our company has run attrition at a, let's call it seven percent, eight percent rate globally. Certain higher and you know other markets lower than others, but actually, you know, quite low. That's spiked up as you can expect in the current labor market. And one of the things we've seen is if we can if we can hold on to that employee for the first several years, then they feel part of the culture, they feel part of the organization, and then they stay and they stay for an extended period of time. But if we can't do that, we lose them quickly. And and so that that onboarding experience, that that cultural integration, what does it feel like to be a part of our company? What do you, what should you feel like? How should you be embedded in the organization um, has has really moved to the forefront of our thinking? Yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Because, yes, you can onboard everyone virtually. But how do you um, 
uh, make sure that they feel they can feel and f- what because in the past you could feel and be part of the culture because you were in the office. But how do you recreate what is the culture of your organization when someone's remote and have that stickiness, like you're saying, and, and, and make them feel like they're connected to something bigger? Um, what, what are some of the things that you've done to try and do that? Yeah, so part, part of the stuff, Chris, is you know just thinking about one, I agree with you, the idea of onboarding someone virtually and having them remain virtual, it's, it's almost untenable. You know, and, and I think this is something that that we, we need to to reflect on. Um, and I almost go back to at the beginning of COVID, what you saw is a number of companies immediately say, we're going remote forever. We're never yeah. going to come back to the office. This is the new normal, et cetera. And, and a lot of us said, pump the brakes a little bit slow down there's there's some unintended consequences of doing this one do you know that employees want that does the what is going to happen to corporate culture and etc so you know one of the things we've been very clear about is the office remains the focal point of where we do our work so we remain a hybrid workforce but we've been really clear to say that where you do your work is the office in the first instance and then hybrid in the second. So now we've not come out and been so bold to say you must be in the office three days a week, four days a week, these separate days. We let managers kind of own that. But at a corporate level, we said we want you back. And it's simply because of that, Chris, which is, yeah. you know, the idea that we can embed or retain the culture that we had over time is it's going to degrade. If, if we don't do that. So that's been the first thing we've done. Uh, the second is simply acknowledge that, you know, we've had probably 30 to 40% of our workforce that had never met anyone. You know, they went through two years two of years. this and, yeah. and they're, I mean, I've never met you. I feel like I know you. Yeah, it's true. Right. We've, we've met, met so many times um, only virtual. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and we have now, you know, in our company, we probably have four or five thousand employees that that have never had a chance to meet anyone. So, you know, so it was also a very um, directive event, like on when when our offices open back up, get get those people back in, almost re onboard them back into the organization. So so a heavy focus on that. Um, and then I think the last thing is, Chris, acknowledging that we've moved into a, a, a digital world, you know, whereas, you know, onboarding did exist in previous worlds through coming to the office, meet the leadership team here, learn about the company, maybe see a video, go to this event, all that blah, blah, blah stuff. Um, it doesn't happen the same way anymore. So it's actually investing into technical platforms that can push a similar experience out to employees in a consistent manner across with the entire with organization that allows them to feel like they're there. Cause yeah. that, cause we recognize we can't get everyone to go back to the way it was before. Is that a new, did you have to invest in some, a new platform for that or did you have so something in place? We, we did. So we, well, I mean, we use success factor, we use SAP success factors as mm-hmm. our, as our main platform. Um, but we bought a very specific onboarding module from them that we, you know, will implement across the organization to ensure that. And, and part of that strategy is exactly because we want to ensure that every employee comes into the firm. Um, they get the consistent message from whether it's from our CEO, whether it's from their divisional leader, whether et cetera, that there's a bit of consistency across that. And, and if we're honest, we lost that. You know, we during COVID, we were onboarding employees in, in a haphazard manner because we kind of made it work. You know, you said, great, yeah. you're just going to make And I think we did an incredible job. I'm like, I, I give, you know, our 400 people in the HR community and, and you know, an unbelievable, you know, um, you know, gold star, you know, for this, but, but it wasn't consistent and, and, and that's, and there's nothing you can do. So we have to now recreate that consistency that also comes without being physically together, which isn't, it isn't that easy to do. Yeah. Did you do any, like, did you do exit surveys for those people that did leave? What were the main feedback? What's the main feedback that you got? Yeah, it's great. So we do exit surveys for all of our, you know, employees and, you know, main feedback has been a combination of, concerns about career and, and career progression. Now, if we think about that in a remote environment, where whereas before you had the ability to, you know, work with your leader and, you know, work with the team in a normal way, you were, you know, always seen, 
You know, it's very that's, clear. That's wasn't also it? In, yeah. Yeah. It was in, you know, right now you're, you have employees who are unseen, you know, for a large percentage of their day and, and how, so, so as leaders, how do you keep them engaged? How do you, how do you see what they're doing? Do you need to, um, you know, it's a different, it's a different way of, you know, acting. So, you know, it's really, Chris, a lot of people are leaving for, um, you know, for career reasons and, you know, and also simply burnout. Yeah, you know, I think that's something that, you know, we talk about often, you see it in, you know, in a lot of the mental, you know, well-being surveys, but the past several years have been really, really hard. And, and, and it's not just been hard mentally with the environment and the family pressures and, and everything around you. Um, it's been hard at work because, you know, corporations have had to still make their profits, you know, produce um, you know, new product, et cetera. So you're expected to kind of do a little bit of everything. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's everyone. <laughs> you know, we're, we're, all, we're all seeing that um, as well. But what about performance? Something we haven't spoken about much is so many mm-hmm. companies, I actually see quite a lot of companies kind of avoiding this topic and kind of treading on eggshells a little bit around their employees. Mm-hmm. How are you dealing with, the side effects of poor performers, especially in a leadership role in this t- new environment that we haven't really experienced before with managing virtual teams, et cetera. Yeah. And I think Chris, you hit on a, a, a it just such an important topic that um, we've, I'm going to say we in the corporate community, probably over the past two and a half years have, I'm not going to say we've let it slide, because I think that would be, you know, that that's not probably true. But we we became so empathetic yes. to the for good reasons, that, for good reasons, for good reasons. Yeah, exactly. absolutely. <laughs> for good reason. Yeah. And, and that's and that's okay. And I, and I don't regret any any pivot that we had to make to make sure that we sustained a mentally um, positive workforce. Yes. That, that is absolutely the right decision mm-hmm. to make. And it, and it, and it conti- by the way, it continues to be that it, because I think you always have to manage a brutal performance culture with a culture of caring. There, there's, there, is a, there is a right balance there. Now, that being said, you know, a culture of performance doesn't also mean, you know, that, everything can slide and people can do whatever they want, whenever they want, et cetera. And that that's, so it's, you know, so, so we're, we're taking, you know, our corporation on that journey more toward um, an outcome based, you know, performance culture than an input based. And I think that's, that's been the biggest challenge is, you know, if I talk about performance and how we've managed in the past from a a leadership perspective and this maybe can even go back to you know hr 101 that we were all taught you know when we first started out in these industries you know you started out talking about you know a lot of management by objectives and let's put in my you know goals for the year and all that um and what that what that caused was this interesting dynamic from performance of you know how many things you did was how you were, you know, assessed at the end of the year. That's that's a you know a very traditional way of, of doing HR. But we've made it made a pretty um, aggressive pivot toward outcome based performance management. So it doesn't matter if you you know did fifty different things for the year. What did you actually do to produce value for the organization? How did you drive this initiative, that initiative? How did how did we make money? You know, based on based on what you did, and um, and that's a journey that Chris we're on at the moment. You know, and and something that we you know continue to push for. But it's um, but it's not easy. You know, it's not easy because it's a it's a it's a mindset shift in terms of how you lead someone, and and you don't necessarily worry so much about okay, did you do these ten tasks? You worry about what did we deliver back to the organization that changed how the organization worked, that delivered additional value above and beyond what was expected. That's a that's a different conversation that you have with your employees, and it's 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 we're if, we're, if I'm honest, we're on that journey with yeah. our employees right now what do you think uh if, if you already hadn't if you haven't already done so is going to be the biggest challenge in both shifting the mindset but also the processes and how you operationalize that yeah um so from a, a process talk from a process perspective and then we'll get into the mindset so um process perspective is is continually embedding active performance management in our 
you know, just in our mindset. So it, think back to, you know, what's, what's a normal process. You set your objectives at the beginning of the year, you probably have a mid-year check-in and then, you know, you get your performance review at the end of the year. That's a normal HR process. And, and you can't lose sight of the fact you have to mandate parts of that, but good performance management is continual. Every time that you're in a discussion with your employees, it's unambiguous how they um, are perceived in the organization. You know, you never want them surprised at that. So it's it's one imparting real continuous performance management, you know, on, on both our leaders and our employees. If you don't know where you stand, ask where you stand. Where do, you know, is this task that I accomplished, was it, did it meet your expectations? Did it not? Did it deliver value? Um, there's also a demand management part of this too, Chris. And what I mean by that is, in, and I'll talk about this from an HR lens, and this could, you could extrapolate this out to any part of the organization. It is understanding that the work that you're doing has been requested and needed by part of the organization. And, and if we're really honest with ourselves, that's not always been the case. You know, and HR is probably one of the, um, I'm going to say, worst purveyors of, of this, where we can create content, we can create processes, we can create stuff, and then try to sell it to the business to say, <laughs> yeah. hey, look what we did. Yeah. And you find out that well, we didn't really want that. We didn't really need it. And how many, how much resources did you spend toward that activity? So I think it's a, it's a combination, Chris, on the process side of being demand led. First thing, understand what you're doing. And then always having those regular check-ins. Am I doing it the right way? A lot of it is, it's, it's how the big consultancy firms have worked with their clients forever. You know, if you think about it, you know, they check in all the time, they, they understand and they don't get paid unless, you know, what they do actually delivers value. Um, so there's that. And then the mindset shift is, is, is probably really simple. It's moving away from getting someone to just list all the tasks they did to list, this is the value I added in the organization. Um, that's not easy to do. It's very shift. easy for us to go back and look at the, the, you know, the, the lat, the ladder, but the, you know, we really need to, to be focused more on outcomes. Yeah. I used to have this conversation with my co-founder all the time. He won't mind me saying this because he would be in the office for very long hours and I would be mm -hmm. in for a few hours and leave. And we'd had this, co had some confrontations and I, I would say to him, it doesn't matter how many hours you're here. It's about the value. <laughs> it's like, it's the, out, it's the, it's the outcomes. You know, I come in, this is what I'm delivering. These are my outcomes. I could be here for another three hours. <laughs> I could be here all day. I could have a list of things, but we need to focus on what are the things that we're doing that are giving us the outcomes because that traditional model of, you know, the person who's in the office the most is, is doing the most work. Is this not true? Or the person that's doing the most yeah. tasks, like you mentioned, is, is, doing, the mo is doing the most work. It's also not true. Is you know what are the things that you're doing that are pushing the needle you know forward and and like you just mentioned are directly aligned with the focus of the organization and and the drivers that they're focused mm -hmm. on and you mentioned you i love the fact that you mentioned hr as an example <laughs> of 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 of, uh, of doing that in any other way which is so true i think we've got a lot better now at doing that in hr and making sure we're more business aligned and focus on business outcomes and working backwards from there, yeah. but for the longest time, that is how we operated, right? <laughs> in in that oh, way. it is. Yeah, and in some of it, I learned. You know, Chris, one of my one of my favorite jobs in my career was when um, I was the the HR partner for an IT part for for um, the IT organization within a major bank, and it was huge workforce level, you know, role. Um, but one of the things that they did was they were very clear. Sometimes you would get credit for actually reducing the amount of work you did yeah. so it, which was actually really fabulous it was a, it was a brilliant mindset change to say great you support these 10 applications you actually were able to decommission six of them good for you you know and and that's that's such a mindset you know change for people and and i kind of have always held that you know to say you know that's and i use that example over and over again with people yeah my one of my close friends is a, an engineer for a large oil and gas companies and he constructs mm -hmm. like you know, billion dollar pipelines in like the Middle East, you know, these are projects that just can't go wrong. <laughs> but you know, a, a, yep. day, a day extra is a difference between making hundreds of millions. And if that pipeline's down for one day, it's costing you literally t hundreds of millions probably. And they had this crazy 
million, I don't even know how many steps, but I remember him running me through it. It was like so many steps in this process that it took to go through this end to end to swap out this piece of the pipeline. And in his own time, he basically rewrote the entire process because he was like, as an engineer, he understood that this is just, there's so much we're doing here <laughs> that doesn't need to be in here. That's taken us extra days. And it was, I can't remember the exact oh, number, yeah. but I know that when he rewrote it and pitched it to the founders of the organization, that it saved them hundreds of millions a year just by him sitting down yep. going, why are we doing it this way? Why are we, why have we got so many processes? <laughs> and it wasn't even his job to do that. He was just frustrated <laughs> by, by the point that he's spending more time doing a job where he didn't need to um, as well. And he was, he was very handsomely rewarded <laughs> for, 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 for doing yeah. that, even though it wasn't it his was, role <laughs> yeah, as well. But how many, how many sure? things are in organizations are like that, right? Because so, so sometimes we're so focused on what should we should do next and what we should add, mm -hmm. whereas a lot of times it's like, what should we take away? Is where you can have the best oh, impact. Absolutely. And I realize even as a leader, so many times I am the bottleneck in our company. Yep. And, and it's about removing things, actually, as opposed to adding more as well. Chris, I, I cannot agree with you more. One thing that I... I try to impart on the team is, and this goes exactly into what you just said with the pipeline example, which is every time that you create a process that takes the business away from doing their job yeah. is time that they can't make money for the company. And it's, it's one of the things that drives me absolutely bonkers in, in any company <laughs> when you have you know, you, you told me you came from a sales background where you were starting you're in kind of sales today, yeah. you know, but if you, but if you think about that, every time that you are not out talking to a prospective client, talking to someone and you're doing some internal work, you're not making the company money and, and, and having an infrastructure that actually cares about that, you know, is hugely important. And, and you can, you can adjust your, the economics of how you run your company so much by both Yes, focus on cost, but also focusing on that efficiency, you know, at the end. How do we make it so unbelievably easy for our employees to work with our own function so they can do their own jobs? Yeah, I've got another example, actually. You just you just brought it up in my head, which I, I think I spoke about maybe years back on the podcast is so a great example of this is in sales where I walked into this very kind of like Wolf of Wall Street type environment. <laughs> so, you know, huge sell for people just smashing the phone, you know, doing you know, 150 phone calls a day, you know, two and a half hours of talk time on the phone. You're doing, you know, 10 to 15 sales pitches and it was just super aggressive, right? And that model had been going for years and years and years and years. Uh, I started there at 17, kind of started off in the traditional model, but started slowly realizing that there's a better way, like this old school way of smashing the phone and spray and pray approach, <laughs> hoping you're yep. going to fix someone. I was like, I don't want to keep doing this. So I started actually ignoring <laughs> that and actually spending, rather than spending hours and hours a day smashing the phone, I would spend three hours a day researching my clients. So actually understanding the, the industry, their needs, you know, everything about them. I would I'd find their LinkedIn profile. I'd even look down the bottom of their LinkedIn profile, figure out what that person's hobbies are because people used to list them back in the day. And really understanding who my customer was, then I would pick up the phone. And within a few years, I became the top salesperson globally. But I remember being brought into a performance management review. And this is where this comes into play. And they were like, Chris, you know, you're you know, doing, you know, four or five times the revenue that mo the average salesperson doing this is amazing. However, we've noticed that your call times are really low and you're, and instead of doing 150 calls, like we ask you, you're only doing 50. And I was like, this is insane. What, what yeah. you're like, uh, you're asking me to be a shotgun and just try and hit something. And I'm a sniper rifle. I actually said that it sounded pretty cringe at the time. It still sounds terrible today, but mm -hmm. I, that's, that's the only way I could explain it. I said, everyone else is just trying to yeah. hit any target. I'm very focused on my target, which is why I have four times the sales, but you're still trying to manage me and mm -hmm. say, do all of these other processes and spend all this time doing things that don't help my outcome. Is my is is, is, is am yeah. I being rewarded for call time and number of dials 
<laughs> or am I being record, uh, rewarded for the amount of money I generate? And they were like, money. So why are you sitting here telling me that I'm not doing my job because I haven't done enough phone calls? And uh, even after that meeting, they would not let me change the sales process. It was only years later when I became the sales director that I actually changed it across the whole business. And I was like, this old way <laughs> of working, yeah. we need to work smarter, not just smash and hope we get some deals. But I yeah. remember the, so many wasted hours and phone calls just for no reason. So I'm a bit of a, went on a bit of a rant there, but it's, there's so many companies that do similar no, stuff like it. that. Yeah. It's the same with my team now. I'm like, I ask them sp specific questions around our particular clients. And if they can't answer them, I'm like, don't call them. You don't understand yeah. their needs <laughs> and, and, and really what, 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 why did, if you can't answer that question, how can you sell them our product? Um, doesn't make yeah. sense um, as well. well. What's great, Chris, is, is you, can, you can take that a step further and it can be, it can be lunacy from the corporation standpoint. Yeah. You know, think about it from, you know, someone who's sitting in front of you saying, okay, Chris, our best salesperson, you know, as you said, he makes 50 calls a day um, and everyone else making 150. Chris produces this. What if we can get Chris to make 150 calls a day? Then he's going to, you know. That's what, is, they no, that, that what, their, what they said. No, that was their, that is exactly their rationale. They were like, if you do 150, yeah. you will make this. I'm like, no, it doesn't. No, it, it doesn't work that it way. Doesn't work that way. And it, it's similar when LinkedIn came along. So I kind of pivoted from cold calling to social media set you know through selling through social media so setting up calls through linkedin and reaching out to p potential clients that way and i i kept that secret because i was worried that i'd be i'd worried that i'd be you know reprimanded for doing it and all of a sudden i was getting even more sales and like and people are like chris how are you how are you speaking to all these decision makers and i don't even hear you making any calls because i was setting it up through linkedin and I was setting it up through social media, but it was all genuine. It wasn't like I was just spamming people. I had, I had a genuine reason I was reaching out. There was a clear angle. It was tailored. It was around a particular need. So therefore they, they replied to me because they're like, okay, he, yeah. this isn't just a, you know, a copy and paste message. Chris has taken the time to, to reach out to me. But even then I had to keep that secret <laughs> for, yeah. for, for the fear of being told that I'm not doing my job correctly. Oh, I know. But, yeah. but you also, I mean, you hit on another point around, you know, segregating your clients as well, you know, which is sometimes no one does. So if you talk about, you know, what your, your sales managers wanted you to do, which is, you know, here's just a list of everybody and just spend the same amount of time yeah. on all that. You know, just call them all stuff. Exactly. No, the, the right answer is to find out, you know, where are the clients with the biggest need, the biggest wallet, you know, and, <laughs> and let's really go deep on that portfolio rather yeah. than just, you know, go everywhere, um, which is something, you know, I think corporations have learned, you know, is the right answer. But but that mentality, that you said, the boiler room, you know, mentality, it's, it's <laughs> and hopefully that's that's gone. You know, Unfortunately, I can tell you it's not because I speak to a lot of companies in private and that's very much still the way that it's operated uh, you know, but I, I, I love that though. For me, it bred the entrepreneurial attitude uh, mm -hmm. of, 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 so in a way it was one of the mo reasons I'm here because it, I was like, there's a better solution. There's a better way. And if you're not going to listen, I'm going to go build it anyway. Um, you know, yeah. even it was even in that environment in, I'm sure you've worked in companies like this before where you have this sales versus marketing mentality. It's almost like sales and marketing sure. are competing against each other <laughs> for, for clients. And um, I ended up building my own marketing. I bought my own marketing software and my own marketing database mm -hmm. and taught myself. And I started doing email marketing. So rather than being a cold calling function, I also then started generating lead gen <laughs> for, my, yeah. for my team, which is a whole other skill, right? Which was in secret. <laughs> we did in secret. And we actually pulled money together and bought it ourselves. We didn't even go to the business and say, hey, can you invest in this new marketing suite? We took our own commission, invested that into a marketing suite and was given ourselves a lead generation mechanism <laughs> to, to bring in leads. So yeah. I think it, it built a very good entrepreneurial attitude, but not great for the business <laughs> as well. But, but you know what, Chris, you, you hit on a really interesting you know point that, so, so, 
I work in financial services and, and, and financial services is, is, is one of the more hierarchical, you know, yes. industries. It, it just is, you know, you start out places and you build up and, and et cetera. Now I think that's been broken down a little bit, but it's still, you know, quite there, but you, you hit on a point of where good ideas come from. Good ideas don't always come from the top. And, and, and it's, it's having that ability to, to be able to impart your way of working. Hey, I've tried this and it works. And then having leadership that will listen and say, just because you're not the sales manager, you're not the CEO, you know, your idea has value. And by the way, we need to adopt that, that, that mindset of having an idea that the, the best ideas might come from some of the lesser experienced employees, because sometimes experience can be counter to progression. Let's be mm-hmm. honest, it can. You know, experience can, you know, is wonderful in a lot of ways, but it can cloud your mindset around what the, the future might look like if you're not careful. Yeah. Sometimes you're too close to the work as yeah. well. You know, you've been too close to the work for so long. Some of my team members, like Bruno, who's behind behind the uh, mic now producing the show, he's come in and said, actually, I think there's some better things we can do with the podcast, Chris. These are some improvements yeah. that we can make. And I'm like, sure, great. <laughs> let's, let's do it, you know, that we weren't doing before. And it's, it's important because I, I, I've, I suppose, I've, because I've learned from those lessons, I, I want to be a different type of leader because I was in those meetings like you're, like you're describing where I was told, Chris, you're too young. You don't get it. You know, you know, you, you know we, we're, listen to us. We're more, we've got more experience. And I'm sitting in a room like, aren't, aren't I the person speaking to our customers every day? Do you not want to yep. hear what our customers are saying? <laughs> it's not my views. It's our customers' <laughs> views that are telling us these things. So as a leader, I want to make sure regardless if you, you're here on day one or you're here on, you've been here six years, your, your opinion matters. Um, and to be honest, over the last two years, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have been able to innovate throughout the last couple of years and we wouldn't have a company. So that's, that's the importance of listening to the team. Cause when we kind of had a yeah. point where we need, nearly had to close the business because we lost all of our revenue through the pandemic, it was me turning to the team and saying, I don't know. I have, I don't know. I don't have mm-hmm. a plan, but together we're going to come up with one, you know, and, and that's how we got through mm-hmm. um, as well. But listen, um, John, before, before I let you go, um, we've covered quite a few different things, <laughs> but I suppose, um, what, what I want to wondering, you've been, you've been doing this now a while, you know, for a, a number of different roles. What advice would you give to sort of upcoming HR leaders that are going to be sitting in a leadership role in the near future? What advice would you give to them? Yeah. Um, thanks, Chris. I think the, the, to me, understand the business that that you are in first before you start to impart your HR knowledge. And what, what do I mean by that? Over and over, you know, HR kids, um, a good or bad rap, depending on our ability to impart the right people solution for the situation at hand. And, and Chris, I've seen the, the best HR people I've seen can understand that situation at hand first and then bring the solution to the table. What I've seen too much of the the HR curriculum in universities focus on, what I've seen too much of a lot of the best practice um, organizations focus on is, here's these solutions that you come up with and they don't focus on what's the business that you're in? How does your business add value? How does it make money? What's the revenue stream going back? And and what does that mean for the employees who are at the tip of that spear? And, And that would be by far the most important thing is take the time, doesn't matter whether you're in finance, aerospace, oil and gas, you pick it, understand how your business makes money before you start to think you're the greatest HR person. <laughs> Love that. Great advice. And uh, thanks so much for coming on. And uh, hopefully you get to meet in person soon. I have to come, have to come I, out. I would like that. That would be, that'd be fantastic. So no, I appreciate your time, Chris. Thanks a lot. See you later. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care. That was great. Thanks so much for that. that I hope you had yeah, fun. Yeah, my, my pleasure. Kind of, kind of, kind of always 